So thank you all for being here, taking your Easter Resurrection Sunday to be with us here at Platform 85. Just thank you so much. And for all of those who are joining us on our Platform 85 Facebook page and also through YouTube, we want to welcome all of you, and we hope that um, uh, you are blessed by our message today. So if you have your Bibles, which I hope you do, because that is your weapon, that is our weapon of choice. Amen? Uh, if you uh, have your Bibles, turn to 1 Peter 1. We're going to start in verse 3. 1 Peter 1. And once you find that, would you stand with me? You know, a lot of you that have been walking with us understand that I love different perspective. And so I wanted to do something a little bit different today. Uh, I, wanted, I wanted to just really dive into Peter's perspective uh, in the resurrection and, and Jesus Christ and what today means to us all and what it meant to him. So 1 Peter 1, verse 3, Celebrate with praises the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has shown us his extravagant mercy. For his fountain of mercy has given us a new life. We are reborn to experience a living, energetic hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead are reborn into a perfect inheritance that can never perish, never be defiled, and never diminish. It is promised and preserved forever in the heavenly realm for you. Father, we just thank you for your word. We ask right now that you open up scriptures to us. Help us to see. We want to know everything. We want to know every perspective. And so, let these scriptures burn in our heart. Help us, Holy Spirit, as we go. If there is something that we don't understand, that we would come to you first. That you would give us counsel. You would give us wisdom. Jesus, we love you so much. And you are king. We testify to you today. By your word. We praise you. In your name we pray. Everyone said, Amen. be seated. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. So, you know, you think about Easter and it's just um, what it all means and, you know, how the world sees it. And of course, we say Resurrection Sunday. And... It's one of those, I guess you could call it a holiday, when you can't diminish the power of Jesus Christ in this holiday. Even, you know, we talk about Christmas and Jesus' birth. Um, but, you know, through the whole story, once we get to the cross and the resurrection, it outweighs everything. It just outweighs everything. And so I, I love this time of year. I love springtime. It's just new birth, you know. And I love the fact that uh, in the scripture it says we are reborn in what Jesus Christ has done for us. Okay? That is intentional. Okay? That is intentional. We see our weaknesses. Like I said, we, Jesus personified that in the garden saying, you know, Lord, you know, can it be done a different way? But yet he put his faith in a father that loves him so much. And so we don't hide our frailties. We don't hide our weaknesses. Jesus never hid his. He never had a weakness. Okay? But we don't hide it. We have to get to the point to where we've died to it, but we've been reborn and resurrected. Do you see what I'm getting at? Because, you know, trials and tribulations, they are tough. Uh, but this, I'm not going to say it's the sad part, but the thing is, is we're, we're going to go through them. In this life, we're going to go through those. And it's through the resurrection that we can overcome it. The world needs to see that in each and every one of us. They need to see that we have a hope. Okay? 
that we have hope into a king and a father that loves us so much. We have hope that we know where we're going to be when Jesus returns. And see, the, the world needs to see that because in, their, in their trials and tribulations, they're going to be looking for answers that they won't get until they have found Jesus Christ. And he can do that through each and every one of us as we testify the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay? And so reading this, one of the first thing that pops out to me, and it's something that we, uh, we try to build on as our core values and relationship, it's about family. Do you understand what happened to Jesus and everything that he has done for us the, through the miracles, through teaching the disciples to going to the cross, it was a collaboration of family. Do you understand that? It was a collaboration. This is something that has been foretold from the very beginning. Okay? There has always, God knew there was always going to be an old covenant and a new covenant. Okay? But this is a collaboration of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And so there was never a time where they were separated until Jesus went to the cross. When he died, that was the one thing that he did not want was to be separated from his Father because he would take on the sin of the world. And at that time, he was separated when he was crucified and put in the tomb. It was a time where he was separated from his Father. And that's really what he did not want. But he said, Father, your will be done. Your will be done. And so I love the fact that it is a family collaboration. You know, we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for family. We wouldn't be doing the things that we've done here in the last two buildings that we've had if it wasn't for family. And I love when Jesus, when the disciples come to Jesus and they said, hey, your, your mom's out here and your brothers and sisters are out here. They want to talk to you. And Jesus looks around and he goes, who, are my, who is my mother? And who are my brothers and sisters? And I can, I can honestly sit here and tell you, or stand here and tell you, as I look, that you are my brothers and sisters. You are my mothers and fathers. We have done this. This is what God has done in each and every one of us. I was not sent here to do it by myself. I had a wife that was with me, and she's, I wasn't able, I was not going anywhere until I knew she was with me, and God spoke to her, and the next thing you know, it just grew from that, and we've made relationships with so many people that are here that it says, Neil, we want to get behind what God is doing in you and Pam, but you know, as, as I may can give cast a vision, I may can go out and try to do what I can, but I could not do it without each and every one of you. See, it's a family collaboration. Jesus set the example for us. God the Father set the example for us. The Holy Spirit has set the example for us. So we are take note of that and that everything that we do, we do with this family. And we're only going to go as far as the last person in our family will go because of the grace and mercy that Father had in us. He still has that today for us because sometimes we fail. And he says, that's okay. He picks us up. You know what I say. He'll brush you off and say, come on, we're going to keep going. But we're only going to go when you're ready to go. I'm not forcing myself on you. Jesus never forced himself on us. And so we do that as a family. Okay? That's what's great about God's patience with us, his mercy on us, is that he's willing to wait. Jesus is willing to wait. He's watching. He said, I've sent the Holy Spirit. He's right there with you. Let him counsel you. Okay? So are we, do we have problems? Absolutely. But we allow Jesus to help us through all those things. And see, I look upon each and every one of you, and there's new families, there's older families, but do you see where we've come from and do you see where we're at now? Has it been hard? Absolutely. Pam and I will tell you, raising children can be difficult. Your hopes and your aspirations for your children, you know, and you want them to be safe. 
and it's difficult. But I thank God so much that he has been able to teach us and show us and walk with us through all of those times. And we were surrounded by people that did the same thing. People that taught us about scripture. They taught us about relationship and how to have, how to have healthy relationship. They taught us that when our children see us get through trials and tribulations, they grow from that. They glean from that. And so it's a family collaboration. That's number one. I want you to see that. Everything that Jesus went through, it was all because the family said, this is how it's going to be done. And we sang, it is finished. It is done. So now Jesus in heaven preparing a place for all of us. And I want you to know, heaven's coming to earth. Do you get that? Heaven is coming here. So if somebody tells you, oh no, you're going to be plucked, and all the bad people are going to be left? No, that is not right. That is not scriptural. That is because of the wheat and the tares. Jesus is not coming. God is not coming back to pull the wheat. He's going to separate the tare. Those will be thrown and cast out into the fire. And what's left is the wheat. As you and I, heaven comes to earth. That's our Father. That is our Savior in Jesus Christ. Okay, I want to make sure that you understand that. That's this house. That's Platform 85. This is what God has put in my heart. That's what's going to happen. And I believe that with all my heart. Why? Because this is a beautiful place. The world we live in is beautiful. And if you've done any bit of traveling around, if you've gone out of country, you'll see how beautiful this place is. And what greater place it's going to be when our King and our Father bring it. They come and bring heaven here. Amazing. And see, this is all it. It's a family co collaboration. He's still got a plan. It's still in place. Jesus is coming back. And he sits and he watches. How many of you know that we are a gift to God? We are a gift to him. And so everything that we do when we spread the gospel, when we do good, it glorifies him. What Jesus did glorified him. And we take notice of that and we do the same exact things. How many of you are willing to give up your life today? That's a tough thing to say, isn't it? It's easy to do when we say, well, I'll give up my life for my wife. I'll give up my life for my husband. I'll give up my life for my kids, but I don't know about the rest of the world. Well, Jesus wants to get to that point where we'll give up our life for the world. Hmm. Family affair. This was planned from the very, very beginning, a collaboration of God, the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. This, this is a family accomplishment. Do you believe that? See, Jesus, you know, Desmond, Des, we were outside earlier talking about where would Jesus be right now on that day when he rose? Where would Jesus be right now? And of course, Scripture begins to tell us, uh, I go back to the road to Emmaus with the two disciples. And, you know, the two disciples were, they were just up in, you know, they were up in air. They were just arguing amongst themselves of what happened to Jesus Christ. You know, our leaders have crucified him and he is dead. We have got to get out of town. And so at this particular time, Jesus would be, in his holy hoodie, I guess, cloaked up. They wouldn't recognize him. And he would be walking with them, and they would be there. And Jesus would go, hey, what, uh, what are you so intently talking about? And what Jesus began to do, or this stranger began to do, was begin to open up the scriptures to say, I want you to see that all that was foretold back in the beginning was prophesying, was talking about Jesus, of course, I, you know, I would go, he's pointing at himself, but he would be talking about Jesus. 
And of course, we know the, the story. They would get to the end of their journey. They would invite this stranger in. And when this stranger actually prayed over the food, they saw that it was Jesus. But I say all of that is because when I say this is a family collaboration, it goes back, even the prophets begin to testify about this Jesus that would be coming. If you have your Bibles, turn to Isaiah 52. Isaiah 50, I'm sorry, Isaiah 53. I'm going to read out of the New Living Translation, Isaiah 53. He who has believed our message, to whom has the Lord revealed his powerful arm. My servant grew up in the Lord's presence like a tender green shoot, like a root in dry ground. There was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance. Nothing to attract us to him. He was despised and rejected. A man of sorrows acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Yet, it was our weaknesses he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was, a, he was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. Unjust dimmed, he was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants, that his life was cut short in midstream. But he was struck down for the rebellion of my people. He had done no wrong and had never deceived anyone, but he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave. But it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and cause him grief. Yet when his life is made an offering for sin, he will have many descendants. Amen. He will enjoy a long life, and the Lord's good plan will prosper in his hands. When he sees all that is accomplished by his anguish, he will be satisfied. And because of his presence, my righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted righteous, for he will bear all their sins. I will give him the honors of a victorious soldier." because he exposed himself to death. He was counted among the rebels. He bore the sins of many and interceded for rebels. Do you see it was foretold way back? This was some 400 years before Jesus would ever set foot on earth. And it was foretold. So you did get that? It's a family collaboration. God the Father had this planned out. So perfect. So perfect. I want to read this. 1 Peter 1, 2. You are not forgotten. For you have been chosen and destined by Father God. The Holy Spirit has set you apart to be God's holy ones, obedient followers of Jesus Christ who have been gloriously sprinkled with his blood. Whew. May God's delightful grace and peace cascade over you 
for many times over. Do you see, not only did he, that it was prophesied about Jesus, but do, do, do you understand that your destiny is hidden in the prophecies of Jesus Christ? I want to say that again. Your destiny is hidden in the prophecies of Jesus Christ. And that was something that was eye-opening for me. Because here I am, I'm focused on Jesus Christ and his, what God had foretold about him. And yet God shows me, Neil, you're hidden in all of that because of who God's called you to, who Jesus has called you to be. You are now taking the mantle that Jesus left to carry the good news out to everybody who needs to hear it. Amazing. Amazing. And see, now... I have been made part of his family. You have been made part of his family. It's all in your decision to accept Jesus Christ and who he is. So maybe that's something you need to question. Have I truly accepted Jesus Christ for who he is? It's his spirit living in you right now that you would say, I would give up my life just as he gave up his life. If we truly understand the death of Jesus Christ and the death of you and I are not the end, then what is holding us back? That is the power of the cross. That is the power of resurrection. And we have got to get a hold of that. That we would die for the world. I want to throw something out there. It was really heavy on my heart. And I was almost repentant of my thought process. Do you understand Jesus gave the devil what he wanted? I want you to think about for that for just a second. Jesus actually gave the devil what he wanted. What did the devil want from Jesus? Death. The devil wanted Jesus to die. In fact, my thought process was, Jesus, why would you do that for the enemy? Why would you do that for the enemy? And in my prayers, he answered, and he said, I didn't do it for the enemy. I did it for my father. What's amazing to me is that even the enemy in Scripture says that he knows, the devil knows the Scriptures just as probably better than any of us, but yet he did not realize what was also being foretold by prophets that saying Jesus would be resurrected. The enemy totally forgot about all of that. Where Jesus and his Father and the Holy Spirit knew the perfect plan all the way through and said, yet the enemy, you have forgotten this part. This is the part of the scripture that you have totally dismissed. And Jesus says, okay, enemy, I'm going to give you exactly what you want. I'm going to die. I'm going to take on the sin of the world and I'll give you what you want. But what the enemy did not understand was resurrection. That's what takes the cake right there. That's how we win. And so now I'm faced with this. The enemy is still real. He cannot change word. But what he can do is change the truth and turn it into a lie. 
And that's what he's still doing today. But if you really dive in and you allow the Holy Spirit to speak through you, through the scriptures, to truly get to truth, you'll expose all the enemy's lies that they're trying to tell you, that they're trying to tell the world. But you have got to get to that place that Jesus is always the answer. He is always the answer. And so now, the tough thing for me is, you know, and we've been walking in a lot of this, and I'm just being real with my brothers and sisters because we are all walking in a lot of stuff today. And I, can I tell you this? Most of us, it's the older generation that's having a lot of problems with the things we're running today. Can I get an amen for that? I'm just, I'm just going to tell you, we're having some issues. We've had some problems with the way things are running today. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I can't help it. Let me take that back. I can't help it. I can't help it. But see, the ones that I see that are not having this issue, an issue with what's going on today are the young generation because they're busy doing what they're supposed to be doing. And I had to learn from that. I was like, Lord, would you help me? Because I want so much to be angry. I want so much to, to, to go up against what the world is trying to do. Jesus never did that. He said, you, what, you know what you want to do? Love. Honor. I want to task you. Continue reading 1 Peter. It challenged me. It really did. It challenged me. Because it goes into talking about kings and how we submit to kings and how we honor kings. And I'm like, okay, I can really take that word and do some stuff with it. Because who are my kings? Who are the ones that I've been placed under authority? I'm going to leave that right there. And then I have to go back to say, but Jesus. Jesus gave up his life. He didn't say a word. It's like Isaiah said. He was led to the slaughter. He was like a sheep before the shears, and he never said a word. So I'm challenged. But Jesus is my answer. Jesus is my answer. I still have a lot to learn. No, Jesus didn't honor the enemy. Jesus honored his father. Okay? There is an awakening happening. I don't say that lightly. There's some things in the spirit realm that are happening right now. And it's happening to our young people. Okay? It's happening to our young people. God has called me to be a father. And it's a time when the father says, okay, I've got to get out of the way. God the Father did that. He said, I'm going to step aside and let my son carry it. Because God the Father could have come down and he could have took and taken care of it all. He didn't have to send his son to do it. But he did. And I have to learn from that. There is a time when I have to allow the sons and daughters, the younger generation, my kids, to work through their problems. And for the world to see that a young generation has the answers because they follow Jesus Christ. That is where the power is going to be. And there is a, there is a, the, the Spirit is working right now in young people. There are things going to be happening in Mobile. You need to open up your eyes and begin to see. And maybe it's coming, coming, going to be coming through some of you here. When you get a hold of that, okay? Because that's the power. Jesus was at a young age when he went through all of this. See, I can tell you right now, 
the younger generation, see, this is what you expect from the older generation. You expect him to do all those things and be all very vocal. But there is a young generation rising up right now that says, no, we know Jesus Christ and we know the power. And yeah, you may look, may look at us and we may be young, but we know the power of the resurrection. We know the power of Jesus Christ. The world is going to take notice of you before it will take notice of me. The churches are filled today with older people preaching from the pulpit. And a lot of times we say the same things over and over and over. It gets monotoned. But when a young person speaks, just like Jesus Christ spoke, and when the disciples spoke, they were all, they were what, 20? Some of them were teens when they first met Jesus. I think we discussed John was actually around 17 when he met Jesus. And look at where he was at. Look at what he was doing at such a young age. Does it mean I'm going to stop? No. I'm in my 50s. I'm 54. I'll be 55 this year. And the thing is, is my place right now is like the father's place was, standing on the sidelines, allowing his son to do what he needed to do, supporting him and getting up underneath him. And that's where I'm at today. And I'm looking for a remnant. I'm looking for young people that says, I'm ready to take the mantle. I'm ready to take it. I want to prophesy. I want to be evangelist. I want a pastor. I want to teach. I want to be a worship leader. I want to take the kingdom into the medical world. I want to take the kingdom in the education world. I want to take the kingdom into government as a young person, not as an old person. That is the power. That's when we'll receive true revival. It's easy for me to walk in revival. But what about the young people? And so I'm looking at a lot of young people. So when I look at you, you're young people. When are you going to take the mantle? Because you got fathers right there that are supporting you. You got fathers that's right there ready. Take it. What do you need to do? You tell me. I'll give you what you need. If I can't, I'll find somebody who can.